Elon Musk claims that humans could reach Mars as early as this decade. But can we really, though? While we successfully landed on the moon over 50 years ago, we still haven't developed a detailed and viable plan to reach the red planet. So what makes sending humans to Mars so much more difficult, even for SpaceX? First of all, Mars is really, really far away. To put things into perspective, the International Space Station orbits Earth at about 250 miles up. Pretty close, just above the atmosphere. The Moon, at around 250,000 miles, is about 1,000 times farther into space than the ISS. Now, Mars, at its farthest, is roughly 250 million miles away from Earth. 1,000 times farther than the Moon, or a million times farther than the space station. Also, we all know that traveling between planets can't be done in a straight line. It's the same reason you can't throw a ball in a straight line. Gravity. While we can counteract gravity with propulsion, doing so, especially on distant planets, requires so much fuel that it becomes impractical. Instead, we gradually adjust our orbit until we reach our destination. To get to the Moon, we'll be in a geocentric orbit, which is an orbit around Earth. If we want to move quickly, we can get there in a week or less. But to reach Mars, we'll need to be in a heliocentric orbit, which orbits the Sun and is much farther away. Fortunately, there are ways to bridge this gap. Every 26 months, Earth and Mars align at their closest point. Past Mars missions have taken advantage of this window for efficient travel, shortening the journey and making it more fuel efficient. This alignment is also the reason why Elon Musk has set his sights on the years 2029 and 2031 for potential missions. Longer distances mean longer missions, which require more supplies. A round trip to Mars would take at least three years. So, imagine having to pack enough food, water and other essentials to survive in a remote, resource-deprived environment for three years. This great distance is also the main reason for the next difficulty, communication delay. The further away your communication antennas are, the slower the transmission rate becomes. For example, from the space station, we can send millions of bits per second back and forth. It's fantastic, with great communication satellites in place. But when you're a million times farther out in space, using the same assets, your communication rate drops by a factor of a million squared, or a trillion. Calculations suggest that the delay becomes between 4 and 24 minutes one way. That means a round trip for a message, asking a question and getting a reply, could take over 40 minutes. So, no, real-time calls are definitely off the table. Then there's the issue of testing. Unlike on Earth, where Starship can potentially fly test once a month, and Elon Musk even plans to increase that frequency to once a week in the near future. Missions to Mars are much rarer. Like I said, the opportunity to travel to Mars only comes every two years. So, if Starship fails to land on Mars, we'd have to wait another two years for the next unmanned test and even longer for a crewed mission. OK, let's say you've made it to Mars, and now you have one of the biggest hurdles ahead of you, landing safely on the planet. Since Starship is currently considered the most likely vehicle for a human mission to Mars, I'll break down the landing process using this vehicle. The primary challenge in transporting large amounts of cargo to the surface of Mars lies in its relatively heavy mass and its thin, though still significant, atmosphere. During re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, a spacecraft slows down as it passes through, utilizing aerodynamic drag to decelerate. On a completely airless surface like the Moon, the landing process is much simpler. Spacecraft rely on reverse thrusters to gently descend to the surface. Mars, however, presents a unique dilemma. Its atmosphere is too thin to allow a landing method similar to Earth's, but it's still thick enough to complicate landing for large vehicles, preventing the use of lunar-style landing techniques. So far, landers and rovers have relied on parachutes, airbags, or sky cranes to safely touch down on the red planet. However, these technologies are likely reaching their limits. The Perseverance rover, which is currently the largest rover or lander sent to Mars, weighs about one metric ton. Starship, on the other hand, is significantly larger and heavier, meaning it will require a completely different approach to landing. 
Before descending to the Martian surface, Starship will likely need to perform a series of orbital maneuvers to position itself for the landing. This includes entering Mars's orbit and aligning the spacecraft to ensure it's in the right place at the right time for a controlled descent. These maneuvers allow Starship to optimize the timing and trajectory of the descent, minimizing fuel consumption while maximizing accuracy. By orbiting Mars, the spacecraft can wait for the ideal window to enter the atmosphere and begin its descent, ensuring it reaches the intended landing site. Although Mars's thin atmosphere isn't dense enough to slow Starship down significantly on its own, orbiting gives the spacecraft the ability to adjust its trajectory so that it can take advantage of atmospheric drag during entry and descent. Once Starship is on a proper trajectory toward Mars, it will initiate the descent burn, firing its engines to slow down and begin re-entry into the Martian atmosphere. The spacecraft's heat shields will protect it from the extreme temperatures generated during this phase. After completing this process, the only thing left is the final touchdown. As Starship nears the Martian surface, it will deploy its landing legs for stability. While Starship currently uses the launch tower catching method in place of landing legs, it's likely that SpaceX will reattach them for Mars landings. For the final phase, Starship will use its Raptor engines for a burst of power to counter any remaining vertical velocity hopefully achieving a smooth and soft landing on the Martian surface. One thing to emphasize is that during this process, the crews were virtually on their own. As I mentioned earlier, it takes 24 minutes for a signal to travel one way between Earth and Mars. So if something goes wrong with the ship, it will take 24 minutes before the team on Earth is even aware of the issue. By then, valuable time will have already passed. Therefore, Starship will rely on autonomous navigation systems to adjust its descent trajectory. However, if an unexpected issue arises that the onboard computers can't resolve, the landing will depend on the quick thinking and expertise of highly trained crew members. When you first set foot on the Red Planet, you won't be greeted by a lush oasis or a Martian princess, as in the novel A Princess of Mars. Instead, you'll face the harsh reality of radiation. Again. Mars lacks a global magnetic field, combined with its thin atmosphere. This allows high-energy cosmic rays and solar particles to bombard the Martian surface. These intense doses of radiation, along with the associated health risks, could pose a major obstacle to human activity on the Red Planet, as well as the journey to and from Mars. While physical shielding with heavy materials could protect against radiation, the high cost of launching such bulky shields makes this solution far from ideal or cost-effective. To ensure long-term survival on Mars, we must focus on producing key resources directly on the planet, primarily oxygen and water. This approach, known as in-situ resource utilization, ISRU, is critical not only for breathing and sustaining life, but also for supporting agriculture and enabling the creation of rocket fuel. The ability to produce fuel locally will be especially vital when we've nearly exhausted the fuel from the initial landing, providing a sustainable way to return to Earth. Growing food on Mars also presents numerous challenges. One of the main obstacles is making the Martian soil, composed of regolith, suitable for plant growth. The lack of organic material in the regolith complicates this process, and the presence of approximately 0.5% perchlorates, highly toxic salts, poses a serious health risk. These perchlorates can damage the thyroid, kidneys, and human cells, making it even more difficult to cultivate crops safely. And of course, a major challenge in these types of missions is the psychological pressure on the crew. French astronaut Thomas Pesquet provides a good example of the mental strain astronauts face on the ISS. He said, They know problems are inevitable during their stay, but they don't want to be the ones to cause them. The psychological pressure on a crew bound for Mars would be even more intense, as they would have no support in the event of a major issue. On the ISS, astronauts can be brought back to Earth within three hours, but Martian astronauts would be entirely on their own for the two and a half year duration of their mission. They'd constantly be aware that even the slightest error or failure, whether technical or human, could lead to the death of the entire crew. 
It's impossible to fully replicate such a high-stakes psychological environment on Earth. While traveling to Mars is incredibly challenging with current technology, we are steadily making progress to make it more achievable. But before humans can reach Mars, you can help me reach 1,500 subscribers. Your support is a great motivation for us to create more quality content. Thank you. Now, to address the communication challenges, NASA is exploring the development of a relay system using satellites positioned in various locations throughout the solar system. The NASA Psyche spacecraft, for example, is equipped with a laser communication system that enables it to transmit 10 to 100 times more data than traditional radio systems. This laser system, known as Deep Space Optical Communications, is one of two technological innovations on the Psyche spacecraft that NASA plans to leverage for future missions. To grow crops on Mars, the first step is to make the soil arable. In 2022, NASA co-funded a $1.9 million multi-year grant to Arizona State University, the University of Arizona, and the Florida Institute of Technology. The goal of the grant is to explore the use of Dehalococcoides micati bacteria, along with other microbes, to reduce perchlorate levels and introduce organic material into simulated Martian regolith. D. Makati not only breaks down perchlorates into harmless chloride and oxygen, but it also contributes organic matter to the soil through its excretions and upon its death, potentially solving multiple challenges at once. NASA's Artemis program plays a significant role in preparing for Mars colonization. The long-term goal of Artemis is to establish a permanent base on the Moon, which will serve as a stepping stone for human missions to Mars. This plan is based on the theory that comets may have brought ice to Earth, which turned into water, and that similar ice may be found in craters on the Moon's far side. NASA intends to use this lunar ice as a base, although its exact composition remains uncertain. If viable, it could provide water for rocket fuel and sustain a lunar colony, making the Moon a critical checkpoint for Mars missions. SpaceX is instrumental in this effort as it is developing an advanced lunar lander for Artemis, an improved version of Starship. Since Starship is also intended to be the future spacecraft for Mars missions, a successful Artemis mission will provide SpaceX with valuable experience in building a Mars lander. Sending humans to Mars is undoubtedly one of the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced. But it's crucial that we fully understand these difficulties in order to approach them with clear, objective solutions. In this monumental endeavor, SpaceX and NASA will play pivotal roles in shaping the success or failure of the mission. Their collaboration and innovation will be key to overcoming the obstacles ahead.